Typing, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Liu Li. Uh, Liu uh, was, uh, uh, until quite recently, a distinguished professor at uh, Harvard. Uh, he's uh, probably the, the leading uh, scholar on uh, contemporary Chinese literature, uh, uh, an authority on the writings of Lucian and other people. Uh, coincidentally, I just learned today, he's also a, an honorary fellow of the uh, Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences. <laughs> and he was once, I think, a uh, 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 really mentor, right? Am I correct? <laughs> so, all these sort of uh, um, uh, connections. Uh, he's written a number of extremely important books, but I suppose the two that might interest uh, uh, Stat 6 most would be uh, firstly, his book on Shanghai, called Shanghai Modern, which is uh, like a kind of classic now, I mean, everyone refers to And more recently, he wrote a book on Hong Kong, which is like, uh, 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 in Hong Kong, he went from the, took us from the study uh, to the streets. It was really, really a kind of inspired uh, plenary that, that he did, and uh, it came out of this really interesting book. So uh, I look forward very much to you uh, uh, talk. So uh, uh, all I told him was that just do two things. You know, just uh, uh, give us your you know, your your, uh, your narrative, your own personal narrative of Shanghai, and the causal link it to design. So that's all I told him. So I'm not sure what he's going to say, but I'm sure it'll be great. Okay, you. Thanks, Alpha. But Alpha also wants me to be provocative, so I'll do my best. Um, I'm sorry, I just got here last night, so I haven't had a chance to uh, greet all of you. Uh, I have no idea how the sort of the progress of uh, the temper of progress of the seminar, but anyway, I'll do my piece. Uh, I know that most of you have been uh, on the walking tour. Uh, you toured the best area in, Hong in uh, Shanghai. Uh, this used to be the French concession. Uh, for me personally, the best time to do the tour is around 6 o'clock in the evening uh, when, as the Chinese would say, Hua Deng Chu Shang, when the lights are just coming up, uh, when people are having dinner and they, if you sort of loaf around, then you can see or, or feel the ghosts hovering above you. Uh, the, this is the kind of atmosphere I'm looking for. Also, the, uh, you know, the Wutong trees, um, this is a specialty, the French specialty. Uh, but of course, as you can see, it's becoming gentrified uh, somehow, uh, like everywhere in the world. Uh, but Shanghai as a city still tries to preserve its collective memory to some extent. But this is not what I'm, this is not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is to, to sort of uh, leave this out for the time being, because I've said enough and written enough about it uh, in my Chinese writings. We're rather to talk about a new Shanghai, and especially the Pudong area, and especially one building. And this is the building that everybody's familiar with. That's the Jin Mao Tower, which is 88 stories high, now considered to be Shanghai's new landmark and icon, built by a Chicago firm. As luck would have it, as I was trying to prepare for my talk, uh, I went to the Hong Kong Book Fair and I bought a uh, video set, uh, six videos on six architects who have, quote, uh, who are designers who serve for China. So this conference is called Designing China. So these architects and world-class celebrities are designing for China. So we have to see whether they are indeed designing, designing for China or for themselves or for the objects uh, that they are building. So if you could give me 10, uh, 10 minutes or so to show you a little video. Uh, this is the video taken from the official television program uh, of interviews with these architects uh, done by the official CCTV company. So I would like to show this and I will do a little running interpretation because the video is in Chinese. And then after that, I will launch my uh, sort of critique in order to be provocative. So could we show that?
，许多上海人都不约而同地来到外滩对面的陆家嘴，参观新浦镇的金茂大厦。As you can see, these are people looking at this building from the other side. 中文是“金茂”，金茂，第一个字是金，代表金。所以你可以看到，金的颜色代表很多。这是这是。五人一推开门，吓一跳。A a call from a professor. 是一个房间里能够住十几个、二十个人，在中国当时是是。And how they are? 啊，去去去去。When the building is finished, how people are going to the top floor in order to enjoy not the view but the bathtub. Ah, this is on the highest floor, and they are amazed by the beautiful bathtub, where you can really overlook the Shanghai city. The feel is very special. Ah, you give you another angle to look at Shanghai. So, what kind of a feeling are you going to get while taking a bath? 同年，金茂大厦以四百二十点五米的高度被正式列入世界十大最高建筑。这座当时中国第一座也是第二，是第三的超高层建筑。The number two in Asia, number one in China, number three in the world. 是的，新地标。A new landmark for the city of Shanghai. 多数来过这座摩天大厦的人，在惊叹于它炫目的外观和非凡构造的同时，都会不约而同地想要了解它的设计图。然而，人们得到的答案却只有一个 ：SOM，Excellent Building， 这三个英文字母是设计师的名字，它代表的是一家建筑事务所。It's a Chicago firm. SOM. It's the largest in America. With most of the world's largest. One of the largest. SOM, although they have a world-renowned architect, they have top-notch designers. But they have top-notch designers. They have top-notch designers. They have top-notch designers. But they are known as a team, not as one person. We believe that the building should not be a signature. For this is the Chinese director in general of the firm. Every time they get a project, they use that opportunity to express themselves about their idea and their vision of the world. But as long as we don't work this way, we we create buildings. Turn the volume a little louder. Thinking about the user and the future function of building. 每一个优化的方案，他都要很尊重业主的意见。他觉得一个好的设计啊。He feels that a good design is a product of the designer and the client. 尽管 SOM 更注重集体的智慧，但是上海金茂大厦的成功建造却始终离不开事务所里的几个主要人物。他们是外观设计师亚德里安·史密斯。结构工程师马克·萨克斯安和斯坦·克里斯塔，建筑总监彼得·怀斯曼特。迄今为止 ，SOM 的作品几乎遍及全球。这个有着七十二年历史的建筑事务所，早在上海金茂大厦出现之前，就已经设计建成了两个都曾经是世界第一的摩天大楼。这就是高度超过三百四十四米的美国芝加哥汉考克大厦和四百四十三米的希尔斯大厦。而中国上海的金茂大厦是 SOM 在中国建造的第一座超高层建筑。自古以来，人类心中就一直充满了征服高空的欲望。早在两千多年前，圣经就记载了连通天地的巴别塔。当世界进入工业化时代以后，摩天大楼更是成为了欧美各国展示科技水平、国家财力的象征。一座座地标性建筑纷纷出现，而这个浪潮也很快波及到了当时被称为“西方冒险家乐园”的上海。上海。以
九三三年，上海外滩出现了一座高八十三点六米的摩天大厦，这就是被称为“远东第一楼”的上海国际饭店。随着这一地标性建筑的拔地而起，上海从此进入了国际繁荣大都市的行列。直到一九八三年，高一百一十点四米的南京金陵饭店建成之前，国际饭店远东第一楼的称号让上海人为之骄傲了五十年。And this was the tallest. 1983. This was when I first came to Shanghai. 1982. That was what Shanghai looks like. 但是就在这五十年间，作为城市现代化不可缺少的重要设施，楼高的记录被发达国家不断刷新。相比起动辄就超过三四百米的摩天大楼，当时的中国还没有一座真正的超高层建筑。Rising country, so I think a lot of it is symbolic. We are Shanghai, now is Chinese economic metropolis. Of course, it needs to represent China's wealth and power. And an icon is needed. A milestone is needed. Shanghai. 将要建造一座摩天大楼的消息引起了国际建筑界的极大兴趣。一九九三年二月，中国正式面向国际，开始了经贸大厦设计方案的招标活动。接到中方的邀请之后 ，S O M 设计师亚德里安·史密斯随即开始了构思。Mr. Smith and he hit upon a great idea. What's the next one? Stop. He faced the first challenge is to determine what kind of exterior can be achieved by the Chinese demand. They were certainly interested in buildings that would be have a character of of China, both old and new. And we know that whenever you do buildings. Uh, uh, in any country or any different location, you got to consider the local culture and the local conditions. It wasn't just specific to Shanghai, uh, but making it, making it fit in Shanghai. Creating a, um, a landmark building in Shanghai was, was an interest in itself, let alone being a tall building. 虽然中方规定的期限只有短短的三个月。但由于史密斯一开始就找到了一个以中国传统建筑风格为基础的切入点，因此他很快就拿出了设计方案。史密斯这一方案的最大特点就是他大胆地融入了中国古代宝塔的造型元素。其中古代的高层就是中国这些砖塔，他借鉴这个，我觉得他找到了他的。这个就是找到了它的切入点，然后是用一些当地的文化元素来表述它，这样的话呢，非常非常容易，那个被当地接受人接受。So this proves to be acceptable. 宝塔又称佛塔，在中国古建筑史上，它是最具中华民族特色的建筑之一。早在一千三百多年前，这种承载着佛教文化的高层建筑形式，就体现出了中国古代工匠非凡的智慧和惊人的创造力。史密斯不仅借用了宝塔的外观，还借鉴了中国传统佛教文化的理念。他将金茂大厦的外立面设计成了十三节，这种造型体现了佛塔的最高境界。在各国送来的六个竞标方案中，史密斯的方案得到了中方的一致肯定。宝塔这样一种，呃，建筑外形，但是呢，又用了世界上，呃，高新
科技，呃，世界上新型的建筑材料，那、呃、这样子呢，把它有机地结合起来，所以它这个方案在六十八年当中是可以说是最好的方案。凭借这个近乎完美的设计方案，史密斯最终为 S O M 赢得了金茂大厦的建造合同。这个独特的造型也体现出 S O M 融合现代科技、借鉴中国传统文化的设计理念。然而，这只是 S O M 迈出的第一步，金茂大厦还蕴含着更多的秘密，将会带给人们更多的惊喜。I think this is a great example of what some theorists would call、uh, the typical architectural construction in the age of globalization. I just brought a little book,、uh, which、uh, I found in a Taiwan bookstore、uh, by Hans Eberling, called "Supermodernism: Architecture in the Age of Globalization." And basically, it says almost it theorizes everything this. Building stands for that it is neutral. It is an engineering feat. It has the most advanced materials. Its physical presence stands out. It is so excellently built that it stands out in any location, thereby imparting meaning to that area. In other words, basically, this is the the Eberlin's argument.、Uh, he is talking about. The current age of globalization, where、uh, what he calls the traditional notion of place—、uh, a place is an area, is a space that holds meaning, accumulated cultural or human meaning, anthropological meaning—and that whole idea of place is giving way to the idea of space, which, of course, you all know.、Uh, space is somewhat more abstract; it's somewhat neutral,、uh, and this is supposed to be a A, a, a marvelous use of space, of course, going、uh, upwards. In the later segments, of course, the program talks about how ingeniously the firm devises something like 13 elevator shifts, so that different groups of people can go to different floors almost simultaneously、uh, within a matter of seconds. I think all something like 36 seconds, something like. You can shoot all the way to the 88th floor, you know, in a kind of direct flight, if you like,、uh, to the bus stop、uh, for 36 seconds, or you can go to the check-in counter on the on the fifth, fourth floor of this Grand Hotel. I think it's Grand Hyatt Hotel. Or you can go to any of number of offices in the、uh, from floors 10 to floor 50 or something like that.、Uh, and then, of course, in the later program, it talks about how con- how the construction is so solid. That in comparison with the World, World Trade Center, this is invincible. In other words, they test typhoons and everything.、Uh, I don't know whether they check the electricity or not, the Shanghai electricity.、Uh, but in short,、uh, a milestone of、uh, architectural engineering. I think my question is, how do we interpret it? If we go beyond what the concept of supermodernism would like to 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 give us,、uh, here I'm trying to theorize on a concrete.、Uh, let's take this little 15-minute segment. It refers to the, the Tower of Babel. We can ignore that because the Chinese do not believe in in God. I think they use that for fashionable purposes. Right? They they have no sense of the translation theory. They have no sense about multilingualism and all that. The Tower of Babel, no sense of George Steiner. Let's forget about that. But the true issue, of course, is the Chinese pagoda. Now, it only makes a bleak reference to the fact that this is from a Buddhist tradition. And what about a Buddhist tradition? The entire culture of Buddhism, of course, de-emphasizes aggression, gigantic structures.、Uh, in fact, the pagoda supposedly is built. By lay people, especially emperors and kings, who want to atone for their sins, so they build pagodas to accumulate deeds.、Uh, in Buddhism,、uh, they have sort of accumulate their deeds, good deeds. So the question, therefore, we have to ask is: For what sins are, is this construction built to atone for? Which country, and for what power, and for what reason?、Uh, So, in a way, the minute Buddhism introduced、uh, 
I'm sure Chinese intellectuals, anybody who is vaguely educated in China, would ask a series of questions. But of course, having thought through that, basically you can realize that a pagoda is nonsense. It is merely one of the hundred sort of a typical Orientalist clues that they want to throw out to show, see, we know Chinese culture. Uh, for instance, the Olympic Stadium, uh, the Chinese refers to as the bird nest. Uh, people will use the Song ceramic vase, the structure of the Song vase. Or the Chinese poem, something like the phrase, like, you know, a thousand birds coming to court, bai niao lai chao, right, etc., etc. So that you can throw a number of Chinese cultural references in any building. Uh, but I think, in a way, Eberlin is right because this building stands out by itself. You can inscribe meaning on it. If this building is built in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, for instance, I'm sure people will try to throw in a little Arabic motifs in it. But of course, there are Twin Towers. Uh, as you know that a few years ago, the Kuala Lumpur Twin Towers was number one, the tallest in Asia, to be later on surpassed by the ugliest building in Taiwan, 101 in Taipei, right? If you look into the material about 101, of course, the whole idea is built on Chinese bamboo from classical Chinese painting. So that each segment you have, to, you know, it's like Chinese bamboo painting. And it's built up by Chinese engineer uh, uh, who takes great pride uh, in his final product. Now we have the Jim Dasha. Of course, as you know, a, tall, a taller building has been built. If you compare this, this kind of issue, the kind of competition, if you look around in Hong Kong, where I came from, you have not only the IFC, namely the International Financial uh, Center, which is about the same height as this building, but then a much taller building is shooting up on, across the harbor called the ICC, the International Something Building, uh, almost a hundred stories high. And these two buildings were basically like two towers of mammon. As you, the ship comes in, this is your Hong Kong, right? Built two financial centers. So basically, the most obvious sign, it seems to me, for th any theory of globalization is basically wealth. Power and wealth. And symbolized by what Mendel would call financial capitalism or late capitalism. Uh, and it's, it's so obvious that I do not need to belabor the point. But once a building like this is located in a place like Shanghai, of course, it generates additional series of meaning or questions. Uh, this is something that I think it will be interesting to, to explain, uh, to, to sort of explore. Uh, I, of course, like all truth, I went to, as soon as it was built, in one of my trips to Shanghai, I went all the way uh, to the top, uh, a cafe, uh, to have, uh, I guess a famous Chinese financier took me there to have coffee, right? Uh, mind, not mindful of the expense. I, I sat there, I felt I was in prison. Because you see these two sort of, uh, two crosses on the windows. In fact, you cannot see the outside very clearly. Uh, you see through the frames, the iron frames, and through the glass. And then you try to look outside as it did, of course, it's polluted. You couldn't see much beyond the outside. But you have the feeling that you are on the top, you know, on the very top. A feeling that you're hanging on midair. I mean, that's probably the kind of a feeling, the thrill that most tourists like myself would get. Uh, but to its great uh, uh, credit, uh, you do not feel the building shaking at, all, shaking at all. Unlike Sears Tower, if you want to Sears Tower, you can see that. You see, the building is like this. Uh, this is a, it's, it's even better built than Sears Tower. So the question I like to ask is, um, once we enter into the globalized age, uh, would any architecture, piece of architecture, be like the Jinmao Tower? Uh, you may want to raise the same question about the Opera House in Beijing. Uh, or uh, any of the concert halls, uh, museums, uh, uh, whether the intrusion or the presence of all these new buildings, all built by non-Chinese Western engineers and architects, uh, who, all, who blatantly consider China to be a piece of tabra rasa, in which they can do anything they want, see, 
Uh, you compare their sort of explanation and interpretations. Uh, recently, there's a very interesting book called The Oedipus Complex, Complex, uh, not Oedipus, uh, Oedipus, the, high, the tall building, yeah. The Oedipus Complex is, uh, I think it's written by a London uh, reporter about all these big name architects, uh, Kuhas, for instance, uh, uh, and how they're sort of, they have this complex of power and all that. Of course, Ayn Rand said it a long time ago, uh, right, in Fountainhead. If you know the Gary Cooper movie, you know what I'm talking about. Finally, the ending is also with Gary Cooper, the architect, you know, standing high up uh, in the sky as he's playing God, whereas his fiance is climbing up to meet him. Uh, so you can see a kind of a, a Promethean ambition, if you like. Uh, we read uh, Bruno Latour's little essay uh, where, where he advises designers to be Prometheus, but a little bit cautiously, or to steal fire a little bit cautiously, a very interesting essay. Uh, but of course, he does not know that people like Kuhas and others are having a field day. Uh, I think Kuhas has just won, has just been chosen as one of the three conceptualizers for the West Kowloon Cultural District. Uh, the second one is, of course, the, our familiar Norman Foster. People say Hong Kong is like a foster town. Uh, and the third one is a Chinese Hong Kong architect, Rocco Im. Uh, so we'll have to see how West Kowloon uh, uh, turns out. And that is supposed to be the largest cultural area in Asia, uh, a real great tabula rasa area uh, for people to, to, to build and conceptualize. Uh, some of you know that, of course, the West Kowloon project originally has a master design uh, by Foster. Uh, in which you have a huge canopy on top of all these buildings. If you're flying to Hong Kong, you can see this huge canopy in the shape of a dragon. Uh, this is supposed to be Norman Foster's way of intruding or intervening into Chinese culture. Since Kowloon is nine dragons, and all right, the cultural district in Kowloon is West Kowloon, you may as well do a little dragon member, right? dragon dance and all that. Uh, uh, but of course, you can, you can say this is, uh, kish, but it's a kish at a cost of, I don't know, millions and tens of millions of dollars just for the concept. So it is out of public opposition that finally the government scratched the whole idea and started again. But compared to Hong Kong, China builds very fast. So that's one thing to be said about the recent uh, situation in China. The buildings are shooting up like crazy with amazing speed. I have read some other uh, articles and materials by Chinese architects and Chinese writers about uh, the recent situation. And it really is like entering two different worlds. Uh, let me introduce you another book uh, which I smuggled into Shanghai because this is published by the underground magazine Jin Tian. Uh, those who are in contemporary literature will know that Jin Tian was the first poetry magazine edited by Beidao. And Beidao is now my neighbor in Hong Kong, you know, who almost won the Nobel Prize. Uh, but now Jin Tian is celebrating the 20th year anniversary. Uh, but this, they celebrated by publishing a special issue on contemporary Chinese architecture. Where, of course, I read through, there are quite a few interviews, uh, quite a few articles by some of the most eminent architects in China. Uh, and also architectural scholars. One of the things I did not find in the Western writings, uh, our readings especially, except maybe for one or two, is that throughout the Chinese writings, they emphasize the most important factor of contemporary action, and that is state power. Uh, that is to say, most of these buildings are public buildings. They are built by the state, or by banks or commercial conglomerates in association with the state. And this is the Ch what the Chinese would, would call face lifting projects. That is to say, to show your face, to show your glory, or promotion projects. Because once the mayor of Shanghai gets this built, he will be promoted to the central committee. Uh, things of that sort. So the three factors, according to one of the essays, for emphasis would be speed or efficiency with which the building is built. And secondly, cost. Uh, and thirdly, quality. So if you build with great speed, and if you do it within budget, or if you spend a few more million dollars, that's all right. 
So this is your achievement. Only recently, you have the emergence of what might be called a critical architectural culture uh, in China. As I think in the late 1990s, in the last 10 years or so. Uh, yesterday, you heard uh, Zhang Yihe. He is one of the leading architects and a critical voice. Uh, and he's known as a prominent member of a group of experimental architects who come from the societal area, uh, who of course have to sell themselves to build certain state projects. But at the same time, some of them would like to do their own thing. Uh, so their writings, uh, their interviews now constitute, it seems to me, the critical voice of Chinese architectural culture. And this critical voice is totally missing in works by Kuhas, for instance. Uh, if you, Kuhas is quoted by that famous saying that uh, Ch a Chinese architect can build five thousand, what, there are, uh, you know, a year's job is something like 5,000, you'll take 5,000 American architects, something like, you know. Uh, but of course, he's see, he seems to be complimenting uh, Chinese architecture, but basically uh, the status of Chinese architects uh, is quite low. Uh, they basically have to sell their, their skills. They have to, as I said, you, you basically cater to a client. I was not used to it because I read too much sort of a glamour material about Western architects. I read a lot of Kuhas. Uh, who was my former Harvard colleague. I never met him because he's a jet setter. He flies all over the world. I could never catch him. Uh, but uh, apparently I read uh, through his uh, small, extra large, and whatever, and, his, and also his recent book, which has just been translated into Chinese, called A Great Leap Forward, uh, with a trademark, uh, because this is his trademark. He's talking about Chinese. Uh, it's about the Shenzhen area. Some of you may have read. Uh, I introduced this book to Shenzhen intellectuals. Nobody even heard of Kuhas when I introduced Kuhas' name. Uh, uh, and I introduced some of Kuhas' ideas, including generic city and all that, the Shenzhen people. Now, of course, they are reading it. Now he's a big name. Uh, if you look at that book and some of his other writings, he very seldom talked about Chinese bureaucracy. Uh, he did a lot of research about uh, the sort of landscape, about the population pressures, the economics, where all the small cities uh, in the uh, the uh, Pearl River Delta area, and et cetera. But he totally ignores the original historical background of the concept Great Leap Forward. It's an ideological construct. Uh, so Chinese intellectuals and architects will consider this whole building madness to be ideological. That is to say that this is a one sort of outpouring of a kind of mainstream ideology which emphasizes wealth, power, and nationalism. Uh, very aggressive, uh, if not transgressive, uh, very aggressive to push for China to be the dominant player in the world stage. Uh, it is face lifting uh, in the grandest scale and is a massive form of engineering which not only covers architecture but in all spheres of life. Only recently, the Chinese government is starting something like 200 and more Confucius institutes all over the world in order to teach non-Chinese Chinese, Chinese language and other things. Uh, so if you look at this picture, you will see that architecture is certainly one of the glamorous ideas uh, for the Chinese mainstream. So the word mainstream is not my invention. It's the term used by a lot of Chinese intellectuals and architects. No. Now, what about these critical voices, right? I recently, glancing through some of the material, I found one architect who is exactly the opposite of what we have just seen. And this architect, I never met him. He's the dean of the architecture school of the Hangzhou Academy, of the Chinese Academy of Arts in Hangzhou. Uh, his name is uh, Wang Shu. Some of you may have heard of his name. Uh, he considered himself to be an amateur architect, although he's professionally trained. He considered himself to be uh, a non-aggressive pacifist, an alternative to the Chinese mainstream. Uh, he talks about Chinese fiction, Chinese poetry, and especially Chinese landscape painting in order to justify his projects. And one of his massive projects is a new campus, which I have yet to visit, 
uh, in the suburb of Hangzhou, uh, the Xiangshan uh, campus of the Academy of Art. Uh, in this uh, new project, which has been which which is finished, uh, he uses old materials. He also talks about materiality, but he uses old Chinese bricks, uh, stones, and whatnot. And the colors are not shining. Uh, there's not much glass, but there's a lot of bricks. And he's one, he's, you might call, he, well, he's one of these few Chinese brick colors who uses existing materials in order to instill new form into it. Uh, in his new campus, according to the materials, he put all these buildings in an area of high density, but of average height. In other words, nothing is higher than a few stories. And then he built this academic complex as a labyrinth. Uh, apparently, you can never get out of it once you're in. And then, of course, people ask him about labyrinths. Of course, he quotes Borges. But he said, of course, Borges is not only one. He said, I never used Borges that much. Uh, there are three kinds of labyrinths. One is the old Greek labyrinth, right? There's only one alley, you get it, you have the monster in the center. That I, I don't, I'm not interested. Then of course you had the Borges labyrinth, right? The fork and pass and a what. But his labyrinth, presumably, he, he, he used the metaphor of Chinese roots, the roots of Chinese plants. So if you have a tree, you have roots, you have all sorts of branches from the root. And therefore, that constitutes a kind of a matrix, a labyrinth where you are the sea in this rooted plant, where, of course, things were shooting up, so to speak. He has a whole metaphor, a whole system, explaining his uh, architectural designs. But of course, we could consider him to be conservative, because most of his references are from classical Chinese culture. He talks about the uh, Song Dynasty, the Ming Dynasty. He especially talks about the Chinese garden, uh, the pseudo garden. He talks about a serendipity of the architectural process. Let us say that in a typical pseudo garden, when it was built in the, Song, in the Ming Dynasty, you do not have a carefully worked out design. You do it as you see fit gradually. You start with the vague idea, and that vague idea would be like the Chinese landscape painting. And that the crude essential elements would be mountains and rivers or mountains and waters. And mountains could be rocks. So rocks and water become the two key elements of a pseudo garden. And then you put in artificial flowers and plants and whatnot. And then of course, the whole configuration becomes something of a serendipitous labyrinth. I went to a new garden this way in, in pseudo. It was built by uh, some pseudo architect. And you really, he really tries to replicate that kind of feeling. So from this source, uh, Mr. Wang Shu goes into his contemporary uh, issue. Uh, he offers his buildings as a kind of alternative to the Chinese mainstream. If you want to be aggressive, you want to show off, he wants to be passive, reserved. He says that his buildings are not visually striking. So there are no good pictures to be taken. But he says you have to be there to have the actual feel, a kind of on-site feel. Uh, that's why I only found two photographs, and they're really not that exciting. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been there. I have not been there myself. Uh, so basically, it also gives you a feeling of the raw feel, and he uses biology, the body theory. That is to say that a building is something a kind of a, like a biological presence. You work within the body of a building. So your body and the building's body resonate with each other. But this building is not only for the individual, it's for quite a other group of other people. So the whole group interact with the buildings. So he had endless rounds of this. And then of course he says, perhaps one of the most conservative arguments of his would be that buildings can narrate. Buildings always tell a story. Uh, he uses Chinese poetry, he illustrated this. That the way you walk through the building or you look at the building, you can always conjure up stories. Uh, Whereas in a super modernist structure like this, if there's any story, the story has to be imposed. Uh, you do not see any story. You do not begin your concept with a story. Apparently, he 
uh, has his own buildings with, with uh, stories. So these two examples, to me, seem to be quite interesting contrast, at least to give us a sense of uh, the plurality or the multiplicity of voices and uh, alternatives in this great era of architectural uh, design uh, in China. I would refrain from making my personal comments at this point. I hope we can have some discussion, uh, but you can see that my position is, is quite clear. Uh, I'm def definitely opposed to, to Jim Mao Daxia, but of course I find myself closer to Mr. Uh, uh, Wang Shu's idea. Uh, but we can have some discussion and we'll see how, how, how this two case studies can further generate some more interpretive ideas. Uh, this is what I have to offer. Thank you.